History records that President Ziem and his brother Niu were overthrown and murdered in November 1963. But the roots of that act were sown in the summer, and the real plotters were not in Saigon, but in Washington. This is the story of how the plot came about, and how the coup that was planned for August failed. This channel's mission is to challenge the Vietnam orthodoxy through reference to primary sources. Much of what you know about the Vietnam War is either incomplete or false. Please consider supporting this channel and its mission through Patreon. The link is in the description. On August 18, 1963, 20,000 protesters gathered around Saloy Pagoda. Later, the communists would credit their agents for raising such numbers, and to the cheers of the crowd, monks called for the overthrow of the government of South Vietnam. Dissatisfaction with Xiem's handling of these protests was growing. Government officials believed he had been too soft on the protesters and, speaking to a group of foreign diplomats a few days earlier, Vice President Nguyen Ngoc Tho, himself a Buddhist, stated that Ziem should crush the protests without pity. Then on the evening of August 18th, 10 generals met to discuss the crisis, the majority of them Buddhists. They concluded that Ziem had allowed the protests to continue for too long, endangering the war effort particularly as the Viet Cong had infiltrated the protest movement. The Buddhist leaders had also made it clear that they would not end the protest until Ziem was removed from office. The generals were particularly concerned about the influence Thich Duc Nhiep had on Halberstam and other journalists and officials. Their conclusion was that the monks should be removed from the pagodas and returned home, and the protest put to an end, with the acknowledgement that some force would be required since the militants had made it clear that they would not leave willingly. The generals urged Ziem to authorise the forced evacuation of the pagodas and the imposition of martial law. Tran Van Don asserted that the situation in Hue could have been settled had it not been for VC infiltration at Saloy Pagoda. Ziem consented with the condition that no monks be harmed. Just after midnight on August 21st, while police, Republican Guard, and special forces surround a Saloy Pagoda, army regulars occupied other key locations in Saigon. Technicians cut the telephone lines of the US Embassy and the residences of US officials, and Vietnamese officials closed the building from which reporters sent their stories to the US. Although some of these actions were controlled by new and special forces commander Colonel Le Quang Tung, they were largely conceived and executed by the generals. General Zing, the son of a Buddhist nun, was in tactical control, while General Don, also a Buddhist, was in overall control of the operation, and Don himself announced the imposition of martial law on Radio Saigon. Government forces arrested hundreds of monks, nuns and other Buddhists. Militants were also removed from the pagodas in other major cities, the army solely responsible for actions in the north. Thirty of the almost 5,000 pagodas across South Vietnam were seized and around 2,000 people were arrested, although most were quickly released. General Zing noted in his report that weapons and Viet Cong documents had been found in several Saigon pagodas. This use of force ended the crisis, and in doing so impressed the populace, and brought eminent monks to the side of the government. Gordon Everington Smith, British ambassador to South Vietnam, commented that, from the 18th of July onwards, the monks in the Saloy Pagoda increasingly defied authority, to the point at which the majority of observers became convinced that the government must act or fall. Given the passive nature of the majority of Cochin Chinese and the very loose hold of Buddhism, it seems improbable that there will be a further open explosion of resentment for a long while. However, this success was short-lived. The American press condemned the pagoda raids as acts of repression and were quick to publish unsubstantiated reports furnished by opponents of the Ziem government. Halbistam wrote a series of lurid and sensational articles on the pagoda raids and first reported that the army had led the operation before reversing his position on August 22nd when he declared that New had been responsible for the raids and the imposition of martial law without the knowledge of General Don and the army. Halberstam also overstated opposition to the Ziem government, suggesting General Dung Van Min as a replacement for the president. 
South Vietnamese politicians and generals often found it difficult to separate the views of the New York Times and the rest of the American press from the position of the Kennedy administration. And these stories seem to indicate the desire of the US government to replace the M, which encouraged some of the generals to distance themselves from him. Four key conversations then took place. In the first, in a meeting with Rufus Phillips, General Kim claimed the army had been unaware of plans to raid the pagodas and that Nhu had tricked the generals into imposing martial law. Kim wanted to retain Ziem as president, but he wanted the US government to demonstrate opposition to Nhu, at which point the army would remove him. And in the second conversation, the chief of Ziem's private staff, Vo Van Hai, made similar observations to State Department official Paul Kattenberg. Phillips also talked to Secretary of State Nguyen Dinh Tuan. Tuan blamed Nhu for this alloy pagoda raid, stating that the army had not been involved. He also explained that there was no credible replacement for Ziem and repeated Kim's suggestion that the army would remove Nhu once the US denounced him. In the fourth conversation, General Don talked with Lu Conin of the CIA. Don admitted that he and the other generals had convinced Ziem to act against the militant Buddhists and to impose martial law. He also stated that no civilian exile could replace him and that, within the military, there is no one who could replace Ziem. On August 24th, upon receipt of these reports, State Department officials Harriman, Hillsman and Forrestal began work on a memorandum to Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. They believed New was responsible for the Pagoda raids and had decided that the Buddhist crisis was undermining the war effort. The memorandum stated that, the US government cannot tolerate situation in which power lies in New's hands and authorised the Voice of America to announce that New and not the generals were at fault. Ambassador Lodge was instructed to inform the generals that if Ziem did not remove New and make major concessions to the Buddhists, the US would end its support for him and would be willing to support a new leader, ignoring the statements of General Kim, Vo Van Hai, Nguyen Tin Duan and General Don. Under Secretary of State George Ball was playing golf at the Chevy Chase Country Club that Saturday afternoon. Harriman and Hillsman presented the cable to Ball at the 9th tee. Ball asserted that Kennedy's permission should be received before it was sent to Saigon. Speaking from his estate at Cape Cod, Kennedy approved the sending of the cable, but on the condition that Dean Rusk, head of the State Department, and Roswell Gilpatrick, standing in for Secretary of Defense McNamara, agreed with the text. Rusk was told Kennedy had already approved the message without conditions, and Gilpatrick was given the impression he was being asked to confirm a policy Kennedy had already selected. Harriman also contacted CIA Deputy Director Richard Helms, simply informing him of the new policy. He did not contact John McCone, Director of the CIA, or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Maxwell Taylor. Both were strong supporters of ZM. If McCone, Taylor, or McNamara had been contacted, there is little doubt the cable would not have been sent. Lodge had arrived in South Vietnam on August 22nd. He quickly arranged private dinners with the three most influential journalists in Saigon, David Holberstam, Neil Sheehan and Malcolm Brown. Lodge leaked information to them and unlike former Ambassador Nolting and General Hawkins, head of MACV, he chose to remain in Saigon and received his information from journalists Major General John Michael Dunn and Frederick Flott. Dunn, working as Lodge's Chief of Staff, later remarked that the journalists were not neutral observers but active participants in events and that Lodge depended on them for information. More experienced journalists who were not resident in Saigon but visited periodically defended Ziem and during August, Marguerite Higgins wrote devastating critiques on the articles written by Holberstam and others raising factual and analytical errors. These critiques were printed in the New York Herald Tribune and impressed government officials and newspaper editors. One editor at the New York Times sent Halberstam a letter encouraging him to take care in his articles with regard to this incongruity. But without being resident in Saigon and without consistently writing articles on Vietnam, these advocates for Ziem did not have the same influence on Lodge as his detractors. Hours before Lodge received the cable, he had advised against removing Ziem. 
He warned in a presidential intelligence checklist of serious fighting between competing military elements if the military should decide on a coup. But his position then changed, and on August 25th, he proposed that the generals remove New and then decide for themselves whether they wanted to retain Ziem. Upon receipt of the message, Ball immediately authorised Lodge to move forward with the plan. Lodge then directed the Saigon CIA station to transmit the message to the generals, and apparently on the orders of Hillsman, the Voice of America announced that Washington officials had said that police had made the pagoda raids under the direction of New, and that aid might be cut unless Ziem removed the police officials responsible. Lou Conin of the CIA then passed Lodge's message to General Kiem. This message, and the threat to cut aid, transformed the position of the generals. They believed that the Kennedy administration required the removal of Ziem, and understanding that Ziem would not sacrifice New, the generals decided to overthrow him to avoid the risk of losing American aid, which was vital for the war effort. The weekend's events were then subject of an angry Monday noon meeting. McNamara, McCone and Taylor were boiling with anger, and at the end of a ferocious tirade from Kennedy condemning those behind the cable, Forrestal offered to resign, an offer the president declined angrily. Kennedy then asked McNamara, McCone and Taylor if they wanted to cancel the policy. The three men turned the idea down. Doing so, they believed, so soon after its adoption, would undermine US credibility. Twelve hours later, Kiem gave the generals reply to Conan. Some of them would conduct the coup within one week. On August 27th, Kennedy cabled Lodge and Hawkins, asking their opinion on the chances of success. Lodge was fairly positive, but was uncertain of a quick victory, while Hawkins believed the situation would be finely balanced. The next day, August 28th, Kennedy met with a large group at the White House to discuss the coup. Former Ambassador Nolting told the group that he had grave reservations and that only ZM could hold the country together. He went on to suggest that he believed Madame Yu could be removed from the scene and that New himself could be made less conspicuous. Harriman contended that the war was being won while the generals were with ZM, but that they were now abandoning him, ignoring the fact that they were doing so because of State Department pressure. Ball remarked that, we are already beyond the point of no return, but Kennedy did not agree. In other conversations he would repeat that he hoped, Halberstam and the New York Times have not taken us in, and he was troubled by the general's lack of enthusiasm, and by a report that stated pro forces outnumbered those loyal to the plotters by two to one. His reservations were transmitted to Lodge with a request for more information. These doubts did not deter Lodge, however, and on August 29th he informed Washington that there was no turning back. He was aware that the conspiracies remained hesitant and was concerned to assure them of the continued support of the US. He recommended that General Hawkins give them a collection of messages previously sent by Conan, and if that gesture failed to encourage them, the Americans should suspend aid and publicly announce the suspension. In spite of his reservations, Kennedy authorised this course of action. The coup did not take place, however, as New put the special forces on alert after hearing of the plot. The plotters concluded that they did not have the strength to overcome Ziem, and a day and a half after Lodge's message, Richardson, chief of the CIA Saigon station, informed Washington that this particular coup is finished. In a meeting on August 29th, Ziem asserted that now the Buddhist crisis was resolved, the government could get back to winning the war, and the principal task of building democracy through the strategic Hamlet program. The previous morning he had met with members of the Vietnamese Sangha, and he concluded the meeting had reached a complete solution, with mutual respect. The generals that had promoted and executed the pagoda raids which had so animated the State Department had been reluctant to remove Ziem until the cable of August 24th, and what that message had started would be carried forward not now by Washington, but by Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge in Saigon.